uh, for more than a decade. Thank you, Dan, for that, and inspired uh, many of us at Google to write and publish through all of his work advocating for that. And um, Dan has uh, many things to share with the UX community in his uh, talk today that I have previewed. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan. So welcome, Dan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris. When this topic of giving a keynote to QuanCon first came up, I started thinking about my career and I realized that I've been doing some version of UX research and AI for more than 40 years. And so I found myself sort of staring down the river of time and thinking about what I would talk about for this group. Here's a question for you to start with. This image, is it a river? How would you know? I will tell you, it's actually a fjord, so that's really salt water. But it looks like a river. This is relevant for our discussion today because I'm going to ask you throughout the talk, what's AI? Does it matter? What's the user experience of this? Why should we care? So with that, let's get started and tell you a little bit about what I do. I think of myself as a cyber tribal techno cognitive anthropologist. <laughs> and that really handy title means that I think about how groups of people understand, come to learn, use technology of search systems and more generally AI systems, right? So I talk about and I interview people. So for example, this is me in my natural habitat. So if I was an anthropologist, I'd be looking at me standing up in front of a class or watching a young woman using her phone or looking at a researcher using their desktop. How do they think about these systems that we're building? I'm also historically a software engineer. I wrote a lot of code, mostly before most of you were born, but that's okay. Uh, the real focus of my career though has been, how do people make sense of complex data or complex systems like AI systems? And so let me tell you, let me cast our minds back a little bit and start with a sort of uh, discussion of what it means to have an AI system and how do we understand it? So let's focus first on user model. Now a user model is how the system thinks of you, the person. What representation does it have of the user, right? Now, I'm gonna cast your mind back to when I first started doing this, not, but 1982, when the man of the year, and which is exactly the phrase they used, called it the machine of the year, the computer, 1982. That was also the year CDs were first released to the public, just to calibrate what we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> this is an audio CD, this is not a data CD. That would come next year, 19, late 1983. So back in 1982, I was working at Xerox Park, and we were given this task of, hey, smart guys doing UI at Xerox Park, make this usable. And this is a big, complicated copier, printer thing, think of it that way. It's about, I don't know, two meters wide by about three, two and a half meters high, I mean, a meter and a half high. Big, complicated thing. And this is what the UI looks like. Yeah. This is why you don't want to take on this job. <laughs> uh, so as was pretty clear, this is very complicated, sophisticated machine. So they came to us and said, hey, why don't you build an AI system to help people use that machine? So we said, sure. So I was working with Richard Fikes, who was a well-known AI researcher at the time. And his, his thing in life was to build plans, uh, automatic planning systems. My PhD had been on AI planning systems. So I went to Xerox Park and I started working on this device and we're trying to figure out how to get it to be reasonable for people. How do we make this usable? So I talked to Lucy Suchman, who was an anthropologist at the time working at Xerox Park and she said, hey, Dan, I know what we should do. We should do a usability study. And I'm an AI engineer. So I said, great, what's a usability study? So she told me what a usability study was. And so we started view, interviewing people as they used our fancy UI. And this is a reconstruction because I don't have screenshots from 1982. <laughs> it wasn't a thing, it wasn't a concept. Um, and so you could select a bunch of the buttons up there and you say, I want 24 copies, double-sided, original, single-sided, original, blah, 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 all this stuff. And it would basically create a plan. 
Now, the way this AI system worked is it would prove a theorem, which would then, and when poured out into terms of the copier, would tell you what to do each step. This was very cool. Height of AI technology at the time, and it was provably correct. So the mathematician in me goes, ah, oh, this is great. I know not only does this work, but it's provably true. So we built then a, I built a fancy user interface for it with 3D shaded animated graphics, just like you would expect today, but this is 82. So as an example of what I had to do, I had to write the matrix multiply kernel routine because it didn't exist at the time. So I still have code under my fingernails from that experience, <laughs> right? So anyway, here's a, uh, actually a couple of frames from that study. Uh, this is Alan Newell with a sort of balding head and Ron Kaplan, who's a really well-known linguist. Arguably very, very smart people. And what was surprising to me about this was we would run people and people, people, after one after the other, run them in pairs, run them in trios. Didn't matter, they could not complete the task. And I thought, wow, I need to get in some smarter subjects. <laughs> And that's why we got Ron Kaplan and Alan Newell. We brought them in and said, hey, we want you to use our new AI system to help you use the copier. And they failed in exactly the same way. That's when I had my Saul on the road to Ephesus moment. I had this epiphany that maybe it's not the AI system. Maybe it's me, UX designer, who doesn't know anything. And that's when I switched into HCI. Now, I kept doing AI, and for the next, you know, 42 years, I've been doing this ever since, but here's the observation. Poor UI blocks great AI. That AI system was provably correct. I knew it was right. I knew it was right. Didn't matter. If you have crappy user interfaces, a crappy user experience, you're not gonna get your AI out. It could be world-bending AI. It doesn't matter. So, is it a river or a fjord? So instrumental to making subsequent AIs that I worked on, to making them work was to build what we thought of as a user model. That is, what does the system know about you? So in my next phase of my AI UI career, I started building intelligent tutoring systems. And there it was really important that we would understand, or rather the system would understand what you, the user, you, the student knew. So how could the system sense what you, the user knew? mostly by behaviors, by what was shown, tracking all that. So we would look at what the senses, what the displays were given to the user, along with what they did with them. How would they interact with them? Could they answer the questions correctly and so on? So we did all this kind of thing. We looked at the language use of, of people in interacting with the system. We would create explicit models of their behavior. We had a whole thing that was representing what the user knew at any one instant. However, let me tell you something important. A user model mm -hmm. is not the same as a context window. So I took the old notion of user model. It's not the same because you represent all this additional stuff and you don't forget it when the context windows moves on, mm -hmm. right? So this was the, <clears throat> I'm not making this up. This is a knowledge graph that I built in 1985, the publication is 1988. Um, and this is actually representing the knowledge you need. Uh, so I guess I do have screenshots from the 80s, but nevertheless, <laughs> in general, I don't have them. Um, uh, this is a knowledge graph representing what you needed to know in order to use a multimeter, which was a particular tool that people need to know how to use. If you ever took EE, you've used a multimeter. Right? So we had this representation of things like where different parts were and whether or not you knew where the, uh, or the ohm scale was on the display, or if you knew how to get to the range switch. We knew that, and we tracked not only when you learned it, but when you displayed that you didn't know it, when you forgot it. Because a user model is not right once, it's track over time. Okay. So we did that, and this should actually not come as a surprise to you, because this is very much like what Khan Academy does with their student model. They've got this big knowledge network, it's, you, know, you can look at it, and so here are some of the nodes in that network, and they track. Do you know how to count objects uh, up to 10? Do you know how to cat objects by two? And they track all those behaviors, building a user model of the student. So this is not perfect. So user models often are inadequate for representing users generally. So what's missing? 
for example, the emotional state. Did your parakeet die yesterday? Thought might make a difference. Or how sophisticated are you? Are you a really brilliant user and learner who progresses through the material quickly, or do you not track exactly what's going on? What else do you need to know about the user in order to make your AI system work well? Let me tell you a couple failures. Um, Google Maps, our friend Google Maps, uh, told me that I had to check in to the comfort suites at UC Davis because it was in my calendar and Maps is connected to calendar and it says, oh yeah, you got a reservation, blah, blah, blah. It didn't know that I canceled by phone yesterday. Now, if you're an old school AI person, you go, I know this problem. This problem is the frame problem. So how do you maintain a model of everything that changes around when you just change one thing? Mm -hmm. The second problem here is that not everything goes through Google. I know that's a shock. But I actually picked up the phone and talked, and I didn't use a, a G phone. I didn't use any of that stuff. I used an <clears throat> iPhone um, and, and canceled the res. So this is a problem with all AI systems, is keeping your system models, your user models, up to date with reality. And you probably, you might have seen this, people at Google, uh, where it tells me, the alert comes up on my phone, says, hey, leave now, two hours and 11 minutes to get to Bodega Bay. Bodega Bay is a conference room over there. It's, but it confused the conference room with the city of Bodega Bay, which is in fact two hours away. So we have a type mismatch. When you're doing your knowledge based on strings, this kind of stuff happens. So this is why you actually want to think about what knowledge means. Bodega Bay, the conference room, is not the same as Bodega Bay, the city. So the flip of a user model is the mental model. So the user model, remember, is what the system thinks about you, and the mental model is what you, the human, think about the system. I've been deeply interested in this for years. How do people understand these things? So in particular, one of the properties of mental models is that they support how you know about machines, how you know about all kinds of their properties, what normal is, what abnormal is, how to correct them, et cetera, et cetera. They also support this little behavior like positive transfer. So if you've got a game controller in the upper left, you use one of those, your knowledge will almost perfectly transfer to the one in the bottom right. That's positive transfer. Negative transfer would be if they switch the red and the green, and it would be annoying, but it wouldn't be fatal. Note that cars keep the brake and the accelerator pedals left and right, no matter which country you're driving in, right? When I drove in the UK, I would have killed myself if they had switched the pedals because it's more consistent. The gas pedal should be next to the center line. No, wrong. If you're getting people to transfer from one model to the other, you want to support positive transfer. So I'm interested in how people understand how search works and more generally complex systems. And throughout this talk, I'll be using Google as sort of my, Google search as sort of my exemplar for a lot of AI systems. Because even though it was not advertised as AI until relatively recently, it's been AI since the beginning of time. Google time, Mountain View, it's only time zone that matters. <laughs> That's a joke for the people who do logs analysis and for Google. Um, <laughs> so uh, my query here was for the name Oslak. Um, and if you look carefully, the A has a little halo on top, a little ring on top, right? And I spelled it correctly because that's the way you should spell Oslag's name. And it shows up and you can see the results. Now, if I spell it without the ring A character, I get somewhat different results. And that's fine. It's a different token. It's a different term. Okay, that's not bad. But suppose I do this and I search for Oslag using command F. I use the ring character here, and it matches all of the terms without the ring A. That's not positive transfer. That's random behavior. And I know what happened is that the group that implemented Command F, Control F, was not the same as the group who did tokenization in Google search, right? They didn't talk to each other. So you get this wacky behavior. So what happens if you could say, go to Google Docs, and I type Oslog, it still matches. Ugh, that's no good either. Trying to find ring A, the character, and only ring A, the character, can't do it. There's no way to quote, quote it. But if you go to Microsoft Word, it doesn't do it, which is the correct behavior, I would argue. 
you search for ring A oslog and it gives you no matches. Correct. So bottom line, transfer sucks when you're doing control F across all these different platforms and systems. Now, this is kind of a problem throughout a lot of the systems that we build. So this is Google Drive, everybody's favorite, right? So I typed in a query here, owner, Jesse type presentation. And if you hit enter, it says you have exactly one result. There it is. I thought, well, that's interesting. I seem to remember some more documents by him. And so it turns out if you just type owner Jess H at Google type presentation and stop, that is do not hit enter, don't hit enter, don't hit enter, you get five results. What's going on? Let me guess. The people who are doing instant pop-ups like this is not the same team as who's doing this, the, the regular search. So we have, we see, what was it that it's called? You see it to see the panty lines of the organization. And this is where you see it. What does this do for users? How do I, what's my mental model of this? My mental model is the pop-up searches are better than the regular searches, right? But I don't know what the failure is. If suppose, it always shows five if you do this kind of pop-up behavior. Suppose you wanted to get 10. You can't do it. There's no way. There's no scroll bar for that. So you see where this is going. How do I think of the systems that we use? How do I, a human, think about these AI systems we're building? So you all know that spell check, right? Spell check is probably the single most successful AI tool in anybody's toolkit. So in this example, this is Google, um, Google Docs, it correctly points out with the red underline that that's the incorrect spelling of there. Even though it's correct, it's out of context correct. Right? Same thing with can't. Can't is a real word without the apostrophe. Fine. So it correctly gets identifies these as incorrect spellings. And so it says, oh, here, if I, if I click on that can't on the right, did you mean can't with an apostrophe? Yes, I did. Good job. Fabulous. However, another property of the AI systems we build is that they can do very clever things like this. I can go to Google Photos back in 2017 and say, show me pictures of my cat. Awesome job, awesome job. Shows roughly 200,000 <clears> um, pictures of my cat in various settings. But now, of course, if I do it like last week, I get one picture. Excuse me? What happened? I did not delete those pictures. <laughs> There's no way I would delete all those pictures of my cat. The answer is the behavior changed. AI systems have this unique property, even worse than regular software, that they change constantly. You know what I mean. You know this stuff changes all underneath us all the time. If you're a developer, it's tough enough. If you're a user, how do you build a mental model with something that's constantly in flux? The UXR analysis problem and I would argue the quant com problem is how do we measure this stuff? How do we measure the effect of constant change and evolution? The PMs are going to argue, well, we did this you know, because well, they made it better. Well, hmm. have you measured the user's mental model? No, you have not. What does that mean? What does it mean when someone's mental model is constantly trying to evolve to catch up to the latest fancy, the latest fashion? I'm interested in how people think about all kinds of AI systems. And so here's Google Maps. So interesting question. I wanted to go from that point ETH over near the hospital over to, to the other side, near the Google office in, in Zurich. Now, here's a question for you. I said, get, show, show me that route and show me that route. That's fine. Did a good job. What do you believe about that true, that path? What do you believe is true about that path? Is it safe? Would I use this path after midnight? Is it the fastest way if I take the tram versus why? You know, what are all the trade-offs? People mostly don't think about that, right? This is a concept that's going to come up again. It's people satisfies. It works. Hey, good enough for me. But there are routes that Google Maps has recommended to me in downtown San Francisco late at night that I said, no, there's no way I'm doing that, right? What do I know that it doesn't know? More importantly, what does the average user believe to be true about these things? 
their mental model of the root maps root finding algorithm, which is bona fide AI, right? What do they know about it? What do they think about it? Here's another example. So I was in Boise, Idaho, and I want to go to Stanley. So the day before I make the trip, I do this, and it says, hey, it's going to take you two hours and 40 minutes. Drive this northerly route. Uh, great. Go to sleep, get up the next morning, and it says, wait a second. It's going to take four hours. You got to go this way. And there's no way for me to ask. Why? Is it just arbitrary? Is it just screwing around with me or what? And of course, when I actually start driving, it reacts me yet again. So how do I think about the root finding algorithm on Google Maps? Is it just playing with my head or is it trying to optimize? I found out later the upper left corner in the north northwest portion had huge forest fires, but it neglected to tell me that, right? We're going to come back to explanations. But there's a lot of cases where people's mental model of AI systems depends crucially on exposing internal information, in this case, about blockages in the root, so they understand why and what's going on. So is it AI? Is it a river? Is it a fjord? Here, this, this has probably happened to you. I'm sending a message to somebody, and it says, oh, you wrote C attached in your message, but there are no files attached. Do you want to end it anyway? I don't know about you, save me multiple times, right? Awesome, great AI, Google. Now, I happen to know it's a regular expression. It's, there. it's not AI, right? <laughs> but it looks like AI. It looks like it's super smart. It, it chimed in at the right moment. Is it AI? No, does it matter? When does it matter? When does the underlying functionality depend upon being AI or not. And I want to argue, here's some things to think about when you're designing with AI, right? Do not do this. Do not say we're going to figure it out with machine learning. I want to pe have people in the center of all of our equations. So you do not start by saying, this is a major critique of Google, Microsoft, every company I know. Don't say you're an AI first company. That's like saying we are a steam first company. We build all of our technology with steam. Like, that's irrelevant. No, you're trying to transport people from A to B. You're trying to help them with whatever methods work. Attached files, not AI. Doesn't matter. Awesome, right? So the fundamental question for I think for all of us is in what ways does AI address the user need in a valuable way, right? So I, I'm pretty sure I saw this somewhere, in it, but it's a great idea. Here's a, a potential product. PM might say, hey, I want an intelligent agent that will recognize that your nephew has a birthday, you missed it, I, the agent's gonna write a nice little birthday greeting present, greeting for your, your nephew and send it off. And good job, right? Is Bob happy? Is the nephew happy? Probably. Hold that thought. The real question for a lot of the future AI work is to what extent do we allow agents to do stuff for us? When it's spell correction, it's pretty straightforward. I spell like that? No, I meant that. When I said that and it knows that my real friend is named John Boyd, that correction is okay. Next question. Suppose I write in my email, the population of Japan is 110 million. Google knows it's not 110 million. Should it auto-correct to say it's 125.1 million? What do you think? Suppose I type in my email message to you, the World Trade Center was destroyed by terrorists flying planes in the building. You could imagine a version of Google that's controlled by a different actor that says, oh, no, no, no. It was destroyed by a cabal of the government using explosives. You see where this is going? To where on the slippery slope do you want to stop the corrections? Suppose John, Bob's nephew died last week and the frame problem kicked in and he sent a nice birthday greeting to a person who had just passed away. So all of a sudden, all these issues start to come to the front. Does your model of Google include concept correction? Should it? Trust me, if you, if you deliver that as an option, and oh yeah, there's a control panel, they turn it on and off, you know, you know, Nobody goes to the control panel, statistically speaking, into the control panel to change the settings. 
Everybody gets to default. So you know about hallucinations. I've got a couple of fun examples here. So which US president went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison? Andrew Jackson did not graduate. Too, all right. This is just clear hallucination. Um, or my favorite one was when I asked um, on LLM to write me a short biography of me. Uh, it, and it's really interesting. At least half of it is wrong. It's plausible, but I have never been to Waterloo, Canada, let alone started my academic career there. You know, okay, fine. You know, what I want you to think about is that this is fun and games until it becomes really serious. You've all probably seen this. The point is, I've got a lot of examples like this. So does everybody else. And it doesn't seem to be influencing people with respect to their understanding of what they can trust and what they can accept. So I did a little test. I used two of your favorite large language models. And I took, I, I found a nice Wikipedia list of 4,962 composers. And I, I checked. <clears throat> They're actually all real people. And I wrote the obvious prompt query in Google Sheets and said, does this person have a, a website dedicated to the preservation of their music? And you can see it says, no, for Michael Van, van der Ah, no, 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 it's great. So ChatGPT said, oh yeah, out of that list of 4,962 composers, 1,214 do have websites, of which 49 are total, totally wrong. They're hallucinated, okay? So I used another of your favorite LLMs, same thing. It said 90, but 4,700 of them have an answer and 95% of them are incorrect. I know this because I wrote another piece of code that lifted the URL out of the answer and did a who is on it. Guess what? Most of those don't exist. But if you look, for example, over here, it says uh, Torvald uh, Torval .dk slash en. Very plausible URL. Problem is the, the domain doesn't exist. Okay, so it hallucinated really, really badly. So the fundamental question for a lot of the work we do is to understand how do we design and then understand the user behavior, the mental models of all these systems we're building. I want to tell you, there is this property of people, this inevitable social response to technology. So I don't know if you see a face in that. Maybe you see a face in that. Maybe you see a face in that. And this effect is called pareidolia. Dodd Norman wrote this book called Turn Signals Are the Facial Expressions of Automobiles. And, you know, he's kind of right about that. The point is, pareidolia is the imbuing of characteristics, of anthropomorphizing things that look like they're reasonable. Now, many years ago, Joseph Weizenbaum in 76 wrote this very simple program called ELISA which allowed people to interact with it. And he wrote an entire book, which everyone should read, Computer Power and Human Reason, which points out that that conversation between a system and a person quickly leads to incredible trust, incredible belief in the fact, in the belief that that is an actual person giving actual psychological advice. What's interesting about this is I then would assign this program to my students when I taught AI for a decade at the University of Santa Clara and at Stanford. And I would say, hey, you have two weeks, go implement ELISA. And they would then turn in reams and reams and reams of conversations. And I stopped giving this assignment because I learned far too much about my students. I just had, you know, I had to stop it because they would just spill their guts and I didn't really know about their failed relationships. So Nass, Cliff Nass, Brian Reeves, Young Moon, all these folks basically point out that people have this inevitable response. When coherent prose comes out of the computer, it is imbued with a sense of humanness that you cannot turn off. This is just something that happens with people. And so, remember this? Let me tell you, my analysis of all of the LLM technology is that it's really cybernetic mansplaining. It's plausible. It sounds coherent, and it comes out at you slowly, just as though it was being typed by somebody, right? It doesn't have to come out like that. Just saying. It could actually go, boop, here we go. But no, we, we put this little UI thing in there. And yes, I know there's a whole story behind it. Eh. When I run the API, I get a JSON back with all the stuff in it, right? So it doesn't need to come out as a you know, character at a time. 
But when you're living with a cybernetic mansplainer, do you ask that cybernetic mansplainer about mushrooms? One of these will kill you, one will not. Let me give you a big hint. Not a good idea to ask, no matter how multimodal it is. Doesn't matter. In fact, if you don't want to skip the whole LLM thing, you can go and buy this app, which has five-star reviews. But only survivors get to give it a review. So it has huge survivor bias. Right. So the meta information that you have to know is that in some ways the cybernetic mansplainers are not trustworthy about certain things. So don't ask about musicians and their websites. Don't ask about mushrooms. And do not ask about presidents or how many rocks a human should eat. This starts to be really serious when you start to see headlines like this. New York City has an AI chatbot that tells people businesses to break the law, they're not taking it down. Why? Because it's the best thing we've got. If that's the best you've got, you've got deeper problems, right? Air Canada famously had their chatbot give all these offers to people that they then had to support. And recently there was a case in, in Belgium where somebody was going back and forth with an Eliza-like chatbot and he committed suicide based on the recommendation of the chatbot. You probably remember Kevin Roos and his discussion with Sydney, the early version of LLM from Microsoft, tried to get him to leave his wife. This is an extreme version of that. Don't trust it. Uh, the point, the deeper point here is a cybernetic mansplainer needs epistemic humility. And what I mean by that is epistemic humility is admitting you may not know the answer. People do this in hedges all the time. Hey, Dan, how do I write that regular expression to extract email addresses? Uh, I don't know. I could look it up. That's epistemic humility. Our LLMs do not have epistemic. They will tell you all kinds of stuff. And never say, you know, I'm not sure. Never admit failure. Never go down, swing to the very end. Now, let me put this in an interesting context, which is that's where I think we need to start thinking about AI and how we understand people. I also want to put this in the context of uh, what our research culture is as UX practitioners, both quant, qual, and observational. First, so I want to tell you a few of the myths we tell ourselves. This is about us as a, as a larger culture. And I want to tell you what, what, what has worked and what hasn't. So here's one myth, instant success. We build something and people will come. I've heard people in this building, in the Google campus, say, if we build this cool technology, people instantly adopt it and all will be well. That cannot be further from the truth. So you may not remember, but in 1960, video conferencing was first demonstrated. And 1968 was in the movie, 2001, people thought, oh, it's right around the corner. 68 was the first actual demonstration of video integrated into a display in the mother of all demos. But it was 1992, which is not equal to 1968. 30 years later, roughly, you get see you, see me, which is the real sort of first time I saw a practical video conferencing system, and it wasn't very good, right? But at least we had it. Now, of course, we've got these big complex systems that can support multiple monitors and multiple cameras and integration and maybe potential 3D holographic stuff. Uh, hey. This is what really happens. We get a guy just like me in front of a monitor talking to a camera just like you. Where are the flying cars? <laughs> so the second myth I want to talk about is that technology transfer is not only fast, but it's easy. I worked for many years at Zorix Park where multiple books have been written about how the technology transfer did not happen. And I, can, I could give you an hour just on that one topic alone. But I will instead tell you about one particular strand of it that I know really well. Um, so 1986, Alan Kay included this in a patent application, this sketch of a, a tablet-like computer <clears throat> with a display and touchscreen and whole monitors. 86. Um, now, a couple years later, I was working at Apple. In fact, that was my office. Uh, this is number one infinite loop. And we built this called the Vatimikum, this is 94, so this is roughly 10 years later. <clears throat> this had integrated camera, integrated Wi-Fi, sound, multi-touch display, blah, blah, blah. As you can see, it was fairly, shall we say, clunky. Um, 
uh, so I, I remember taking this to Steve Jobs. He threw me out of his office and said, what are you doing? Get out. It was fine. Okay. Yes, sir. So um, we then spun out a startup to build this. And that's in 1999. We got funding from Xerox to do this. And we built something called the uppercase tablet, which is like that. 1999, um, Xerox said, what are we doing? We don't make hardware. And they sold the whole company, lock, stock, and intellectual property to Microsoft, which then became the Microsoft tablet. So that became the reference platform. So uh, that's what we then, what they then shipped in 2000. Um, and of course, in 2010, Steve stood up and held up the iPad. And I, I don't know how I felt at the moment, uh, but it was strange. <laughs> having tried to sell him that product as a research prototype basically 20 years earlier. So things don't quite happen as fast as you think. You might remember 1984, the Mac being its, it's launched in 84. People forget about the Lisa, which was a better computer. It was a year before, a couple of years before. And so these technology trends don't happen quickly. And I'll argue AI is in the same boat. Okay, this is 1956. And that's Oliver Selfridge, Martin Vinminsky, Solomonoff, uh, John McCarthy, other people you might recognize, right? 1956. And it's only now that we're starting to see the fruition of a lot of the AI concepts that were put out then. And the thing to know about this meeting was the hubris, the belief that they could ship this stuff quickly. Uh, Marvin Minsky was famous for saying, oh, I think we'll solve the language recognition problem in five years, which would have been 1961, right? Speech reco was really only solved a few, few years back. <clears throat> Took a long time. It was perpetually five years away, and then it wasn't. But it took 40 more plus years, 50 years. So I wrote this book as a way to communicate how the user might have a mental model of search to show people all the stuff that they didn't know that they probably should know to show a little bit of working i did not use the word ai in here once but it's very clear that's the way this worked and so the way i work is to do lots and lots of studies so studies like you do i'm pointing at you here on the camera um I've done hundreds of field studies where I go and walk, work with people. I've taught uh, lots and lots of classes, surveys. I've got data from my MOOC, which had four and a half million students go through it. So that's legitimately a real big data set. And I try to understand how people are thinking about this AI system we call Google search. And one of the models that people have is that Google has everything in it, every book, every edition, and it's available 24 seven. And a lot of people will say, that's it. That's the way it works. It's got everything. So in one of my studies, I asked people to draw, sketch out, no, sketch for me, a, a model of what you think Google looks like on the inside, the architecture, how it actually works. And this is not a bad drawing. It's actually by a, a computer science student. But I asked a lot of people, in fact, most of my population was not computer science students, and they draw things like this. It says, several overlapping concentric circles, nonlinear Boolean targets. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I would argue that person doesn't know what it means either. Um, what's interesting about, I have literally a stack of roughly a thousand of these. And 33% of them have the word magic on them. A third of all the diagrams say, ah, magic happens here, right? That means you've given up on having a mental model. Anything could happen and it would be fine because it's uninterpretable. So I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, the way we as researchers connect with our community of people, our shareholders, our stockholders, our um, stakeholders, um, our holders of stakes and shares. How do we connect with them? And so each of these is an interesting topic. I'm only going to talk about eye tracking data and visualization for a little bit. Because there was a time at Google when eye tracking was not a thing. It was not acceptable. I remember having multiple knockdown, drag out uh, arguments with people saying, oh, yeah, we can learn stuff. And then what happened in 2004 and going in 2005, um, I took an eye tracker to um, Disney World. And I set up this really interesting eye tracking study where we would invite people off Main Street like this to use the eye tracker. And we would study how they would do searches and 
It's great, bunch of stuff. And we found um, that advanced searchers skipped over. You look at the eye tracks, that's four different tracks. They skip over the ad block, boom, boom, boom. Oh, that really annoyed the ads people. But we said, if they don't find what they're looking for in the rest of the page, they come back, they do not go to the next page, right? So it was really interesting. Um, but novices don't. They just go right straight through the ads as though they were organic search results. Oh, oh. So what's interesting is when you talk to people, you see that they will say things like, well, the top ad, uh, those are ads? Those are ads? Right? Oh, those things up there? I didn't, you know, all this stuff, right? And you find all these bizarre religious beliefs. We interviewed one person who said, oh, I can tell how much the advertiser paid based on the font of the ad. We don't change the fonts of the ads. And we certainly don't reflect the price of the bid by the font. It was just, you find all these interesting, bizarre behaviors. And so what's fascinating to me about this is when we did this eye tracking study, we learned a lot of deep things, including, and it will give you all this, this one piece of advice. If you're ever going to do an ad study, or you're trying to actually observe people's actual search be buying behavior, you have to do the study with real money. We did one study where we said, pretend that you got $50 and buy some brown shoes. We, we logged everything, we looked at it, and it was fine. We then did the same study. We gave them 50 real dollars, totally different behavior. If you're faking the buying behavior, you're getting bogus data. Throw all that stuff out. Just do not review that paper. Right. So this is an interesting change because all of a sudden we were able to show really practically how eye tracking told us something really important about search. So as you probably know, there's a bunch of, bunch of work that's been done over the years on visualization um, as a way of communicating the inner, deeper mo ideas in, in quantified data. And there are a million charts, right? There are more than this. Ask any user of D3 or ggplot, and you've got a million options, right? Question, what do people actually use? So here's an interesting observation. I did a study here at Google where I went around and I looked at uh, roughly a thousand different presentations, slightly more actually, but whatever. And I went to a lot of different meetings and I wrote down every time somebody used a different chart, what kind of chart it was. I looked, I went around to, to not whiteboards, and these whiteboards are boring, but in the past, whiteboards would have charts all over them, people drawing, right? And you never saw a chart like this. You might see this occasionally in a presentation, but it's very rare because as somebody once said to me, the last thing you want to see is an exec's eyes glaze over when you show them that cool, interesting info biz. So what types, what types of charts do people actually use? Guess what? That's 85%. Yeah, it's exactly what you think, right? And what's interesting is that the difference between above the line and below the line, below the line are data analysts like us. We use all those cool things, but we don't present with them. If you show somebody a force vector diagram as InfoViz for a PM, it's just not going to go over well. And so what makes the visualization a success? I want to tell you a quick story about one visualization I happen to know about. Uh, so I had a, a student, Heidi Lamb, who worked with me and Diane Tang, and she was from University of British Columbia, built a visualization of time series data, really marvelous stuff. And it looks like this. She wrote a Java app that would take in Google log files and then look at sessions and allow you to sort and, and visualize and, uh, uh, and uh, search in different ways. Very cool. It was a Java app, okay? Remember that. It had immense capability, immense capability. It could show you searches that were done by dead people. And it was just phenomenally good. And then, no adoption. What happened? Well, Heidi came back as a full-time employee and rewrote uh, Session Viewer in JavaScript in 2013. It's then been integrated. It's been gotten a lot of use since then. So the important, the important distinction there is it got evangelized within the company. It got converted into a form that people would use and adopt and so on. Kerry Rodden, as you remember from last year's keynote, invented this Sundress visualization, and she succeeded. Why did she succeed? The same reason that Heidi succeeded. 
she was able to show people, given this data, given this implementation, I can evangelize and show you how it works. It's not complicated, right? And so building something like this, you go, if this is your data, all of a sudden you have an insight. It's fast, then that's a key insight. Easy to understand. Let me wrap this up with a couple thoughts about human and AI future. So one thing to think about is we're in this, we, and I mean, we're all as researchers, UX researchers in one form or another, we're in this situation where we have to figure out how do, how do we use these things? How do we control the generative media, the analytic multimedia analysis stuff? How do we do this? And so we'll, are we going to have courses on prompt engineering? If so, does that course have to change daily as the prompt engineering analysis changes? Probably. Uh, what about robo-psychology as a future job description? Susan Calvin was a robo-psychologist in the iRobot series. Is that what we need to be? Do we need to then do psychology on the LLMs? Is it, for example, do you, let me ask you, you, do you say please when you're prompting an LLM? Does it help? How about begging or asking the same question again? All of a sudden, you see where this is leading, right? The psychology of LLMs, the psychology of AI systems. And where I think a lot of this is going is, is we're developing these interesting new interaction models where we've always, you see a lot of co-pilots for X, Y, or Z, co-pilots for GitHub, co-pilots where, you know, for Python generation and so on, co-pilots for writing text. Lots of interesting stuff going on. And it's interesting that we actually have had co-pilots in the past. So this is actually a view of the explore function for Google Sheets, where it would recommend different visualizations for you. That never went anywhere. It was very, very cool. I loved it when we had it in Sheets, but it didn't go anywhere. Why? We need to understand those questions. Why didn't people have the effective model for how that would work? And as we start to think about creating new kinds of things, what does creativity mean now? What does it mean when attribution of style starts to be a fungible object? I can then, for example, in this illustration, say, apply the style of Botticelli and portray Kira Knightley as Venus. And so it knows exactly what I mean. So all of a sudden, style is a, is a possible AI object. And um, I'm going to let this... Just people in video land, welcome to a harp rendition of Synthbach. So a Bach faucet, like you see here, is basically the idea that you can generate, I'm just going to stop that, because it can generate a million hours of pseudo-Bach. Does it matter if it's a river or fjord? Does it matter that it's actual Bach? And so there's some really interesting studies coming out showing that there are a lot of people who can't tell the difference. So I'm going to play just a couple seconds of this just because this is totally fun. I asked Suno to create an emo rock song based on the fact that Peter Norvig and I are teaching HCI to AI at Stanford. Listen, I'm just going to play the first 10 seconds. Peter and Dan teaching AI at Stanford where hearts turn to ice. Robots learn to feel the seeds feel alive. It goes on. But what's so interesting about that, I mean, I, I know there's things like that do this at Google too, but um, uh, it's the long structure, continuity, and consistency that strikes me as amazing. So where does creativity leave us as humans, as UX researchers, right? So we need to be thinking about obvious things like ethics and data collection cycle. What other kinds of issues should we anticipate? And, what future user questions will arise? How do people develop a mental model of the things we build? How can we, as HCI people, figure out what data needs collecting? What do you collect? Are the heart metrics all we need? What kind of data is accepted? What kind of data can we collect? And I want to bring up this really interesting thing that it's not about just developing for apps anymore. It used to be back when I built an AI system for a copier back in the 80s, I had one application 
and I would test it and then modify it. And I would do my B test six months later. That's not A, B testing where we think about it now. So I was developing an app. Now, of course, we develop search or language models in, the, in a larger context. So if, for example, I say, tell me how to make a par chicken parmesan and I get the answer here, why would I ever click through to the website? How does this change the nature of what web developers are going to, website developers are going to build if they can never get people to click through to their target? We need to think about the ecology of these things, not just the fact that I can summarize effectively. Because you know people are going to satisfy us. They're not going to click on Natasha's Kitchen when they've got the recipe in front of them. Or you know about this. People using Google Maps to navigate the Highway 17 over to Santa Cruz. And you get a lot of them, when Highway 17 gets busy, they get routed through Los Gatos, which pisses Los Gatos off. So Los Gatos has been, for example, calling in and saying, I'm sorry, that road is closed today, and putting the block on Google Maps. They are hacking the ecosystem in order to get their town to be nice and serene again. And of course, Simon Weikert, Weikert, the guy in the middle there, has taken to putting 99 cell phones in a little red wagon in order to spoof traffic. And you can see him moving around on Google Maps as roads get blocked because of the phones in his wagon. People are learning to hack the ecosystem. We should be thinking about that before we deploy these things. And of course, smart thermometer thermostats have this unintended consequence that they all are set to default at what, 7 a.m.? So all of a sudden you start to see these green, that green line is a spike in power consumption from a community that has a large number of smart thermostats. Design for the ecosystem. Don't just design for your AI app. Get the point? We need to think about this because the UI, the UX of AI systems is absolutely critical. That was the very first lesson. Poor UX blocks good AI. We need to think about how do we create the framing of systems that is to portray them, right? How do we portray them? Is it omniscient overlord? Is it killer drones? Is it helpful friend? Is it psychotherapist? So we need to think about this HI UX right from the very beginning. I know UX people say this all the time, but it's really, really true. And it's becoming more true as the capabilities of these systems grow and grow. <laughs> Lastly, thinking about the entire ecosystem design and not just the little app you're working on is essential. So I want to leave you with that. And I think we've got a couple minutes for questions. 